Okay. Well, good afternoon and thanks for being here. Last year, I vetoed S-5, the so-called Affordable Heat Act, which established a clean heat standard. Unfortunately, the legislature overrode the veto, so the bill became law. I want to be clear. We don't necessarily disagree with the goals within the clean heat standard, like reducing emissions from the thermal sector. And we're actually already, we've already invested over 200 million in the climate sector in the last couple of years. Our disagreement has been about how we get there. I've always believed affordability considerations should be taken seriously because they're significant. We need to be thoughtful and realistic to make sure we're not hurting the Vermonters that can least afford it. After the legislature overrode my veto, I told Vermonters we'd update them along the way so they have a good understanding of how this will impact them. Just last week, the consultant charged with studying the potential impacts and costs of this law presented their findings. And not only are the costs extremely high at almost $10 billion, the report also points to other challenges, like workforce shortages. And just months before the legislature will be asked to move forward with this policy, there are still many unanswered questions, like who actually pays for what. However, I did see that Senator Bray, one of the architects of the Affordable Heat Act, said it could cost $1.70 a gallon for heating oil. And I think that may be on the light side. And we can't forget about the Renewable Energy Standard, another bill the legislature also passed over my veto, which will raise electrical rates, costing Vermonters millions of dollars. And with the already high cost of living, historic property tax increases, higher DMV fees, a new payroll tax, and so much more this legislature has passed, the cost estimates for the legislature's clean heat standard are alarming. All along the way, we asked the legislature to fully consider the impacts of the clean heat standard and be honest about the costs and complications. Now that there's an election around the corner, we're seeing some legislators have second thoughts. But I'm concerned about what they'll do in January when the election is over. Now, I'd like to end by reading from my 2023 budget address when talking about this clean heat policy. Again, this was almost two years ago. I said, the fact is 70% of Vermonters rely on fossil fuels to heat their homes. To change this, we need to, have, uh, we need to help people through this transition, not punish them. We must also answer some tough questions, which I get asked all the time, like, can our electrical grid handle the load needed for a cleaner and more affordable energy future? How will we make sure people stay warm or charge their vehicles when, not if, the power goes out? And most importantly, how do we make sure lower and moderate income families can afford the switch? There are solutions to these questions, and I share the sense of urgency here, but we've got to get this right. Doing this strategically with the understanding we can't hurt the very people we're trying to help will ultimately get us, get us where we want to go that much faster and with less, less conflict. So my budget dedicates funding to our climate office to develop a real plan outlining exactly what work needs to be done, on what timeline, and what cost. And we'll bring this plan back to you so everyone can see the details. Because as is the case for any project, like roads, bridges, and buildings, the legislature has an obligation to debate and vote on these specifics in bill form, and then send it to the governor for action. Now, you know, this was not the approach the legislature took when passing S-5. We've now spent more than a year working on a legislative mandated policy before 
we knew what it would cost, if it would work, or if we could even do it. And it turns out we probably can't. From my perspective, this is starting to look a lot like single payer. And we should learn from the mistakes of the past because Vermonters deserve better. I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Moore. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before Commissioner Tierney provides details around the study her team recently completed to better inform our understanding of the cost of implementing a clean heat standard for Vermont, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to help frame the sense of urgency that seems to surround this policy. As many likely recall, in 2020, the legislature made a series of obligations on Vermont's behalf when they overrode the governor's veto of the Global Warming Solutions Act, sometimes referred to as the GWSA. Among other things, the GWSA codified as requirements what had previously been the state's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, making them legally binding and opening the Agency of Natural Resources to lawsuits if we failed to meet those requirements. Meeting the reduction requirements will require a complete transformation in how we heat, provide hot water, as well as in the vehicles we drive by mid-century. Specifically, the Global Warming Solutions Act requires Vermont reduce its emissions 26% below 2005 levels by 2025, which we largely appear on track to achieve, and then significantly accelerate emissions reductions work over the next five years to achieve a 40% reduction in our emissions from 1990 levels by 2030. As the governor indicated, I want to be clear, I also share the sense that making this transition away from fossil fuels is necessary. The Global Warming Solutions Act also established the Vermont Climate Council and charged it with drafting a climate action plan for the state. The Climate Council adopted its initial plan in late 2021, which among other recommendations identified the clean heat standard as a cornerstone to fulfilling Vermont's obligations under the Global Warming Solutions Act. As envisioned, the clean heat standard would create market incentives by requiring fuel dealers to obtain credits each year proportional to the amount of fuel they sell. Credits would also be generated each time Vermonters reduce their use of fossil heat or switch to a cleaner heat source by doing things like weatherizing buildings or installing heat pumps, and these credits would then be available for purchase by fuel dealers. Although there are a handful of examples of this sort of approach being used to drive emissions reductions in other sectors of the economy, the application envisioned through Vermont's clean heat standard to transform building heat is a largely untested approach. This also meant that in 2023, when the legislature mandated development of the clean heat standard, there was precious little known about the financial impact this policy would have on household budgets. So, as you may recall, Using the best available information, which was admittedly incomplete, I estimated the investment needed to implement the clean heat standard at the pace and scale required to achieve the Global Warming Solutions Act 2030 emission reduction requirements, and came up with a cost of about $2 billion, which equated to roughly 70 cents on a gallon of fuel. Over the past 18 months, the Public Utilities Commission and the Department of Public Service have engaged consultants and worked extensively to develop a better estimate of the cost, including the report Commissioner Tierney will speak up on momentarily. While the report highlights that some uncertainty remains around the exact cost of implementing the clean heat standard, it affirms that it will require billions of dollars in upfront investments. And the report also notes it will be particularly challenging to shield low-income Vermonters from bearing the economic brunt of its implementation. How to proceed with a clean heat standard will clearly need to be front and center in the next legislative session. And it will be critical that this conversation not take place in isolation, as the clean heat standard is just one of the consequential policies that the Climate Council has identified as being necessary to fulfill the mandates of the Global Warming Solutions Act. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Tierney. Good afternoon, June Tierney, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Public Service. Thank you, Secretary Moore, and thank you, Governor Scott. As the Governor and Secretary have both noted, the administration expressed deep concerns about passing a law 
that set Vermont on a course to create a clean heat standard with so much unknown, things that should be known, before passing a law directed at forcing rapid societal change of such consequence and magnitude, however commendable the objective may be. When Act 18 became law over Governor Scott's objection in 2023, no Vermont-specific study had been conducted that could inform the public or their elected representatives as to whether such a standard was realistically achievable in Vermont, and if so, with how much of a hit to our citizens' wallets. Rather, Act 18 tried to backfill this important analytical gap by directing the Public Service Department to conduct a potential study, which we just completed a little over a week ago. The potential study examines what potential exists to reduce carbon emissions in the thermal sector. And the Public Utility Commission will use the potential study in designing a proposed clean heat standard rule for the legislature to consider in January. The potential study assesses the emissions reductions that are potentially technically feasible and potentially achievable in Vermont's thermal sector against the legal obligations of the Global Warming Solutions Act. The core purpose of the study is to quantify these technical and achievable opportunities for carbon emissions reductions. Specifically, the study was to determine whether there potentially would be enough steps, measures, technologies under the clean heat standard as defined by the requirements of Act 18 to reduce sufficient carbon to meet the thermal sector greenhouse gas reduction targets in the GWSA. That's a complicated analysis. Remarkably, Despite the administration's best efforts and warnings, Act 18 was passed into law over Governor Scott's veto without such fundamental spade work having been done beforehand. Such technical economic analysis is typically what state agencies do before crafting consequential transformational public policy initiatives with large price tags that Vermonters are compelled to pay. But that kind of careful advanced planning and cost assessment didn't happen here. Now, what did the potential study find? I'm going to elaborate a little on what Secretary Moore just told you. Here are four important takeaways. First, the potential study suggests sufficient thermal emissions reductions resources exist that could satisfy the thermal sector emissions reduction requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. However, the potential study also indicates that some of the measures needed to meet the emissions reduction goals will not be cost effective and that any societal benefits derived from those measures do not outweigh the cost to Vermonters. Second, it will be challenging to implement the clean heat standard in a way that is equitable for the most vulnerable Vermonters. Act 18 requires that obligated parties annually secure a certain percentage, 16% respectively, of their clean heat credits from measures to reduce carbon emissions generated by low income and moderate income Vermonters. This requirement is intended to ensure equitable treatment of these important groups by ensuring that they receive a fair share of the benefits of carbon reduction, which can be realized, for instance, by weatherizing their homes and installing heat pumps. The potential study indicates that it will be highly challenging to reach this target to provide direct benefits for Vermonters in the lowest income brackets. The ris risk of inequitable treatment of our most vulnerable citizens under the clean heat standard has been one of the Scott administration's biggest concerns. Third, the potential study further suggests that workforce limitations may prevent Vermont from meeting the Global Warming Solution Act targets. Again. The workforce limitations mean that even if we accept all the cost burdens, we may not be able to meet these targets. In some areas, like weatherization, the study estimated that we need roughly four times the workforce we currently have. This needed workforce growth is no small feat, especially considering the investments we've already made over the last several years to try to increase Vermont's workforce, particularly in the efficiency and weatherization space. The import of this labor issue also spills into other policy realms, 
For example, with the need for added workforce comes the need for places for that workforce to live, an issue that Governor Scott addressed at length in last week's press conference. Fourth, the study points to the risk of costly market and behavioral distortions. Many of the least expensive measures in the early years are expected to encourage consumers to switch to biofuels or biogas in a perfect market that encourages the most cost efficient solutions this will lead obligated entities to prefer swapping out fossil fuel and biofuels instead of making infrastructure investments even though infrastructure investments may have greater co-benefits and longer lasting impact now what does the potential study tell us about what the clean heat standard will cost us it's important to understand that the potential study is not an implementation plan for the clean heat standard. So, while the study distilled cost information that can be used to estimate the costs of implementing the clean heat standard, the potential study does not include a specific cost estimate for each fuel type for each year of the program, but it certainly provides a scope of what the costs could be. And what's next? Well, further analysis is necessary to fully understand and estimate the types and volumes of measures as well as the acquisition strategies that might be necessary for Vermont to meet the clean heat standard. The PUC is responsible for that. They're undertaking that analysis right now in preparing the draft clean heat standard rule that is due to the legislature in January of 2025. As I noted earlier, Act 18 requires the Commission to issue a quote check back report to the legislature by January 15th. That report must include their estimate of the impact of the clean heat standard on consumer rates and fuel bills. As we speak right now, we don't have an estimate for those very important pieces of information. So while we still do not yet know the exact costs of the clean heat standard because the specifics of an implementation plan are needed at that level of detail, what we do know is that there will be a significant cost if the legislature votes to implement this in January. It's also important to note that the cost of the clean heat standard will be additional to, they will be on top of, the costs created by the legislature's revision last session of the renewable energy standard, the one where they preferred their more expensive version to the one that the Department of Public Service put forward. These new legislated energy costs will come on top of everyday costs borne by Vermonters from property taxes to bills at the grocery store. In closing, I'll say this, the clean heat standard would require Vermonters to incur costs themselves to achieve societal benefits that accrue globally. Now this may be good, this may be selfless, this may be even noble, definitely from a legislative public policy point of view, definitely from the public policy point of view of a regulator. But that doesn't mean everyday Vermonters who are struggling with inflation and rising property taxes can bear it. As the process continues to unfold and the legislature contemplates their vote in January, I hope they keep affordability and affordability for the most vulnerable Vermonters in particular at the forefront of their minds. And with that, I'll hand it back to Governor Scott. Thank you, Commissioner Tierney. Now we'll open up to questions. Governor, is there a universe in which your administration would potentially propose or float changing the benchmarks in the Global Warming Solutions Act to, to maybe buy more time or to uh, lessen the cost of, of some of these proposals? Well, I think at this point in time, it's, it's up to them. Um, this is a, a law that I'd asked for some of what you're asking for from the very beginning. Um, so it's law now. They overrode the veto. Uh, they'll be coming back in January, and we'll see what, what approach they take at that point. Are there elements um, of the proposals in this report for how Vermont would need to, what Vermont would need to do in order to abide by the clean heat standard that you think do make sense? 
I mean, could, would, would you be up for picking pieces here and there that do deliver some bang for the buck and get some good emissions reductions in the process? Well, I'm sure the report delivers something uh, that would be beneficial and we could glean from, but, uh, but again, it's too early from my perspective uh, to determine which, which proposals they would be because the proposal on the table will be what they come back with from the PUC. But could you imagine a scenario where it's like the renewable energy standard, where it's the legislature's proposal and the administration's proposal? I mean, and, and there, that there could be a, a version of a clean heat standard that would win your support? Well, again, we had proposed something of that nature uh, with what I read in the budget address from 2023. So, sure, I could envision something, uh, envision it then. Uh, it just didn't come to fruition. Anything you want to add? Um, that's a, a really good question, and I think I would address it slightly differently in my answer. It's not like nothing's been done. There's wide agreement that weatherization, for instance, is the smart thing to do, and in my opinion, the most essential first step. Um, there's wide agreement that you want heat pumps when it makes sense economically for people to install them. So the measures in the study that are explored, many of them, they are bread and butter pieces of any strategy for decarbonization and also energy efficiency. And so there's wide agreement on that. The issue is, does it have to be done using this vehicle, the clean heat standard? Does it have to be done by creating a market that's untested? Does it have to be done by asserting regulatory jurisdiction over folks who have never in the 100 years plus that they have been provisioning thermal uh, services in the state been subjected to the kind of regulation that is very normal for a utility that has the resources of a utility to meet regulatory obligations? That's the issue. Does it have to be done this way? And I think the governor's position on S5 tells you that, no, we see it differently. There are budgets that have been examined in the past where the governor has proposed millions of dollars for weatherization and the like. That was then when we had the money available. He lost those fights and the money was spent on something else. That's a lost opportunity cost that makes it harder for us to do what could have been done at the outset if there hadn't been a fixation on an untested proposition that we should enact a clean heat standard. Only three states in the nation are even thinking about this. Why does Vermont have to be first? Is there a line item in our budget that says Vermonters will pay this much to be first on everything? I don't think so. Other questions? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, I'm sure there will be. <laughs> I'm sure there will be. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Julie? Okay. I also understand you mentioned property taxes. You sent out a letter to education officials earlier this week uh, forecasting or maybe trying to get the ball started or conversation started on, on property taxes. What's your assessment of like how the, the task force has done, how effective they've been, what their work has looked like? The task force? Or the, the, the future of the uh, Commission on the Future of Public Education. Oh. Uh, that property taxes. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's early yet. Um, as I had said when I vetoed um, a bill last spring, uh, that we should be, um, we need structural reform today. We need it now. We don't need it a year from now, two years from now. We need it today. And I still feel that's the case. Uh, and we wanted to just make sure that school boards, uh, superintendents, uh, everyone was well aware that we need to deal with the reality of today. And uh, we wanted to make sure that they were, they were apprised of that uh, so there wasn't a shock when in December, the December 1st letter comes out. We just thought it would be better uh, to start the conversation a few months early. And that's what we decided to do and that's what we, um, why we sent the letter just to get the conversation started. And we'll continue to work with them. Uh, we'll continue to build our budget. 
uh, understanding the cost pressures everyone has and uh, see if we can work together to make sure that we're protecting Vermonters the best we can. Have you heard back from any districts or school boards or anybody that are rethinking some of their spending or doing cost containment as opposed to years past? Well, I mean, they're just getting back into school now. School boards are getting together and starting to, to develop their budgets for next year. So um, I think there's concern uh, amongst them. Uh, it's early yet. I haven't heard back from everyone, but uh, but I think there's a lot of concern. If you do hear back from folks and they say, we would love to lower our budgets next year, what specific recommendations do you have for how we can make that happen? What would you, what would you offer? Well, again, um, we had a, a lot of different ideas on how to uh, insert structural reform last spring and the legislature wasn't interested in taking those up at this point in time. Uh, they wanted a longer term approach. So again, we'll, we'll work with them. Um, we'll have some ideas of our own. Uh, we'll try and implement those, those two. But, um, but again, it's, it's somewhat out of our hands at this point. But we'll, we'll do what we can to work with, with schools and superintendents and school boards. What were the proposed structural reforms well, that you we, put on the table? We put right at the end of the session to lower the property tax burden. We put a number of initiatives on, on the on the bottom line, so to speak, um, for sure. them to consider. But, um, very earlier to that, we did the same thing. Um, the legislature had their own uh, structural reforms that they put out for about 24 hours before they pulled them back. There were some good ideas there. There's some there's some things that can be done. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but it won't be, we won't be able to accomplish it for um, this next uh, next legislative session. Um, I mean, I'm sorry to be dense, but I, I'm not aware of the specific structural reforms that you proposed at the end of the session. So I'm wondering if you can just tell me what they were. Yeah, well again, we, we provided some of those at the beginning and throughout the last number of years. They haven't changed much, um, and we offered suggestions on what we could do to lower the rate. Um, again, well, I pointed back, even at that point, I gave the legislature credit. We were working with them behind the scenes uh, to talk about some of those structural reforms. And uh, for about 24 hours, they, they put those out. You, you probably reported on them. Um, those are some of the things that we think would be essential uh, to um, providing for tax relief in the future and get a handle on the problem that we have in education spending and the structure. So, um, you know, I'm not going to legislate from here. Um, the, the die has been cast, the uh, law has been passed, and the budgets have been passed, and now we have to live with the consequences. But we have to prepare ourselves for what's going to happen in the not too distant future when we put out another December 1st letter that will probably show another increase because we didn't do the tough work over the last two years to provide for structural reform because there wasn't there wasn't an interest in doing so. Commissioner, Commissioner Bolio is on the line. Anything to add? Commissioner Bolio, would you like to add anything to the conversation? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Governor. So, Pete, in terms of uh, from from our side of the house, with the tax department, right? The the big reform that the governor was trying to get some momentum on near the end of the session was uh, reform to the education funding formula um, that had been proposed uh, initially by the Ways and Means Committee, I think, in early April, a version of that, but it was withdrawn uh, later that week. And so uh, we had said, let's, let's keep working on that piece. There were also other elements from uh, the Agency of Education that, that I can't speak to as eloquently, but that was the big piece near the end of the session that we were talking about. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, individual districts don't have the ability to unilaterally bring about structural change. So in the context of this letter that you sent them, um, what specifically do you think individual districts can do now 
to avoid undue cost increases next year? Well, again, they're going to have to dig deep into their budgets and find uh, areas of opportunity. And again, we will work with them. Our uh, agency of education will work with them in any way we can. Um, and we're going to have to, to do our own budgeting with our own budgets, uh, you know, um, devising that. And uh, we'll see where we go from there. I see Secretary Saunders is on. Um, maybe she can describe some of the things that uh, she's been hearing and what um, what we're willing to do with the agency in terms of providing advice as they build their budgets. Hi, good afternoon and, and thank you, Governor. I think there's general consensus and recognition that we're going into another very challenging budgeting season. Um, and so as we engage in that work, the Agency of Education is really trying to ground these conversations in, in data and information that will be objective and helping to inform paths forward. Um, as part of our Listen and Learn tour, we will be engaging in regional planning sessions that will be including our education leaders, superintendents, principals, school board members, curriculum directors, business managers, to really dive deeper um, into the data across a range of indicators, including budget, um, so that we can really capture what some of those drivers are and also identify some of those solutions um, to be able to um, address two, two ends. One is to make sure that we can have a sustainable and affordable education system, and also that we're promoting the best educational quality at the same time. And so that's why we're looking at this comprehensively and engaging the field in very robust conversations that are, are really grounded in the data. Additionally, around budgeting specifically, we understand that it's a very complex system um, and to really demystify you know, what is involved in our education finance system, the agency will be rolling out an education series um, which will provide a number of different um, informational sessions around our system, including um, you know, education finance one-on-one, -on -one, an understanding of the key terms, an understanding of the key drivers. So all that information is really gonna be designed to promote transparency around our system as we identify opportunities to make improvements that at the same time um, promote greater opportunities for students and are sustainable and affordable for taxpayers. Do think, oh, oh, sorry. Um, do you think the work that uh, Barry has done on its school budget deserves a yes vote from voters there? I think they've done a lot of uh, good work and uh, made some difficult choices. And I personally, I'm not going to tell um, Barry how to vote, uh, but I, in my, if I was voting in Barry, I would vote for the budget. I think it's time to move forward uh, to provide you know, a sense of consistency and, um, and just move on. They've done a lot of hard work, and I know how difficult it's been. What, what are your general uh, thoughts or opinions on like a proposal like a Green Mountain Care Board type of, of uh, body, but for school budgets, right? Like if a school budget exceeds a certain cap, then it would go to a review board who would then say, you know, hear evidence, testimony of why it's needed or why it isn't, would make some sort of determination in terms of like cost containment. Is that something that, that you would support or look at? Um, I'm not looking to build out the bureaucracy any more than it is already. Um, I'm not sure that that would have the effect that is needed. And we have, we're a local uh, control state. And so I, I think we're going to have to work within the confines of that at this point in time. I, I, think, I think some of the, the mechanisms for the cost drivers are, um, are issues that we should be focusing on. Uh, and in the meantime, I mean, we, we know, I mean, talked a lot about this over the years, the, the aging demographics we face, uh, fewer kids, uh, a lack of, of uh, workers in the workforce, um, all because of our demographics. And I've, you know, when you look at the number of students we've lost uh, and, and the number of, uh, of kids under 18, for instance, from, from 10 years, uh, 12 years ago to today, um, you can see what's happening. And, and again, the number of people over the age of 65 has increased at a faster rate. 
So it's, uh, it's not an easy issue to address, but we simply, simply need to attract more people into the state. Uh, but to do that, uh, to accommodate them and to build out our workforce, we need housing. So we get back to that. And I think that housing is probably our highest priority, or should be our highest priority at this point. Governor, a question on a different topic, if I may. Um, yesterday, President Biden approved the disaster declaration for Lamoille County uh, after the late June storms. Caledonia County was left out. Um, your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's just a matter of time. We'll we'll get the rest of the declarations. I'm hopeful. Um, but um, but I think I think they'll it will happen. You mean you think we'll we'll also get the declaration for Caledonia? I as believe well? so. Okay. But you know that's up to the president. What other disaster or maybe Commissioner? Morris hard to, hard to keep track of uh, yeah, these no, days. With the number. <laughs> I mean because we're talking about different dates. Um, I don't know if. I'm looking to see if anyone's on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Dan. Governor, I, I'm as well. I know we're working on one more. I, I, I want to just follow up with the dates on it, though, because I'm as confused by these as you are uh, in this particular moment. But I will follow up and make sure you get that information. Thank you. We'll go to the phones. Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Uh, thank you. Governor, uh, last year the, um, the state issued the Municipal Energy Revitalization Program, also known as MERP, um, which invited all the municipalities in, in Vermont to apply to have one, two, or maybe more municipal buildings uh, get an energy audit and also some money to help them with the implementation of that audit and public education about energy efficiencies. Uh, the program said it had $45 million to spend, and after initially doing the energy audit piece, there would be opportunities for municipalities to apply for up to a half a million dollars in funding, grant funding, to do improvements so that their energy costs were not as high. Um, recently, a letter came out uh, that, that said that um, there were 175 different communities who participated in this program, but only 84 were uh, eligible to apply for the additional funding as was originally stated, although it was never told to the municipalities from what we can ascertain. Um, and so all of these communities who went through the process weren't even given a chance to apply. Then this morning, um, a new email came over that said that all the municipalities who participated could apply. Um, I'm curious if you have any knowledge as to what the mix-up has been there. Yeah, I don't know if it was a mix-up, um, and I, I'll let someone who is more um, in tune uh, with the details uh, to talk about that, but it was more about trying to make sure that we were highlighting the municipalities that needed it most, um, the rural c communities with uh, that um, were economically depressed. and. And when it was put into the formula, it didn't work out quite the way we'd hoped. And uh, so there were some who were excluded that probably should have been included. And I believe that's where we're at today. But uh, Secretary Clark. Thank you, Governor. Um, in the interest of trying to maximize the federal dollars and the benefits of this program, we've decided to open the eligibility for all towns that completed assessments as was dictated in the legislation. And so there was a pivot made from allowing only towns with the highest and high burden to apply to allow towns that had completed the assessments in order to ensure we can maximize the federal dollars, but also to give us a full understanding of the scope of the need. This is going to require us, I think, to put some more resources on the grant review process to make sure that we can complete the evaluations of the applications in order to obligate those funds by the end of this calendar year. Uh, a lot of the municipalities feel like that was this was a second pivot 
uh, the original information that came out with uh, a, a great amount of excitement about it stated having $45 million available for both the audits, but also more importantly, these energy upgrades. Um, there was obviously language in there, deep in there, about the 84 communities that were already eligible, but nowhere in the language or the communications were these other municipalities told that they were behind those 84. And so if you do the math and you give $500,000 to the 84 communities, you spent 42 million. If you do some energy audits, which you have 175 and which municipalities appreciate, then you clearly use the 45, but that was not the sense that the municipalities that we talked to was the original purpose was that the 84 were first and there was a sense that something got missed and I was just curious if you could help us with that. Yes, I believe the language in the bill does prioritize communities with the highest and high energy burdens. Um, and so that is still where the focus will be in evaluating the grant applications. But the dollar value is not yet known in terms of what communities will be asking for from this program. And so that was another reason why we wanted to expand the eligibility because we wanna make sure that we are uh, receiving, um, though the grants are capped at a half a million dollars, we wanted to make sure that we received um, um, the accurate requests for grant funding by opening up eligibility because though communities did have assessments done we still don't know the exact number of need until they submit their grant applications uh, I guess the, the question that I would have to follow with on that is if you had to do it over again besides having that information in the original section uh, would it have been more beneficial for municipalities who spent a tremendous amount of time working through this process with the help of the state agencies which were extremely helpful um would you let them know more clearly that they were 85th and beyond in line uh, because I, I, from all the municipalities that we spoke to none of them had any idea about of that particular part of it um i guess i would say um I don't know that I would agree that people are in a place in line in terms of where they stand in the grant application process. Um, but we are, as the bill said, prioritizing based on need. And there are other factors um, that will be evaluated as part of the grant application review process. I can follow up on what those other factors are to give a sense um, of how we will be reviewing the applications that are received. Uh, final question, sorry to belabor the point, but I think the other issue I've heard multiple places is that uh, a lot of the municipalities have still have not received the reports of their energy audits, and yet the window is extremely short if they're even able to apply for funding. Uh, and uh, is there, has there been any transformation to the application process to make it more viable to try and get it in on that tight timeline? Yeah, so we have opened up the grant application process for all communities that have either received, um, for all communities that participated in the assessment process. So I believe there are 21 assessments or energy audits that are still outstanding, but those communities um, will be allowed to apply for the grant and we are working to complete those outstanding assessments in the time frame necessary. Thank you, no, no other questions, much appreciated. Back to the room. Governor, have you heard any movement on the post office downtown? I have not. Yeah. They have not conferred or with us at all. I mean, and I'm talking about the U.S. Postal Service. But as I mentioned before, we want to help in any way we can. We think that Montpelier deserves and should have a post office. So. Did you um, watch the debate? I did. I did. Yeah. What I thought, did you think? Uh, I thought uh, Vice President Harris did very well um, and seems to be a very skillful debater. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens from here. Are you thinking about, I know you mentioned, um, I, I, what is your, your your thoughts on, you know, would you support her in November? Like, where are you along in your decision making? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll make my decision sometime between now and November. Um, 
and uh, and as I did four years ago, and and I'll make uh, I, I will not be voting for um, former President Trump, um, but the question will be whether I vote for Vice President Harris. I think we still have a a lot to learn about her. Again, the, the debate was interesting; it was entertaining, um, but um, but I don't know. Has it really told us everything we need to know? I need to have an understanding of her policies and where she goes from here and how she intends to fulfill them. If you weren't the Republican governor of Vermont, would your choice be more straightforward? Um, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I would like to hear more. Again, I, uh, as you know, I, I voted for President Biden the last time around, probably the only Republican governor who did that, and uh, or at least uh, at least made it public, and and I'll I'll do the right thing when it comes time. But um, but I don't know enough about her. I knew more about uh, President Biden. I've met him numerous times before, and um, and had faith in that he was the right person to to take this challenge on at that point in time. So. What specifically are you hoping to learn about her? Just about, you know, what what she intends to do or policies. Um, Joe Biden, from my perspective then, was a more moderate centrist candidate. Um, in my mind, uh, Vice President Harris is more, much more left-leaning uh, than, than President Biden uh, was. So, uh, that, but she seems to be changing. So. We'll see, you know, what she has in mind. If you were sitting across the table from her, what specific questions would you ask her to try to get to know I her? I would, I would want to know, uh, you know, about some of the statements she's made in the past about whether it's the same questions that that others have brought up, but um, in terms of um, defunding the police, um, the border uh, situation, what she intends to do there. Uh, economic development, housing, uh, what is it going to mean for us uh, here in the Northeast? Um, all kinds of things. I mean, it, I just want to learn more about her. And I think we will. You know, I think at this point in time, I think she'll get out more and uh, we'll get to know her. She's, she's fairly new to the national stage in some respects, even though she's been vice president for four years, she hasn't been uh, been out there, and we don't know that much about her. I don't believe. I also saw you were in um, Massachusetts. You were at Fenway. I think you were behind the wheel of a, a boat. Uh, what? <laughs> what, what did you? Um, was, what, was, what did you take away from it? That was, uh, the, the boat was a simulator. <laughs> right. Um, it was. Uh, it was interesting, though. Very realistic. I thought the floor was moving when we were in there. Um, but um, but it was just uh, taking us out to where the wind offshore wind farms would be, and so um, it was uh, it was interesting uh, to learn more about what they do at the Maritime Academy uh, that was in Buzzards Bay. I think it was in Bourne, and um, it was uh, again it, it's exciting when you're seeing uh, some of this and and the practical side of it uh, is something that I'm always uh, interested in. So, and it's good to get together with, uh, with the Eastern Premiers, uh, as well as other New England governors to see what challenges they're facing and uh, their approaches to that. So, it was a worthwhile couple of days. Wait, it was a boat simulator? Yeah, it was, uh, it was just, it was inside a building and it was uh, 360 degree, you could look all the way around and you're actually, you're like in the, the main control room. What is it? The bridge. The bridge. We're, we're Why not just go in the real boat? It's <laughs> <laughs> to, to, well, this would show you, this showed, you know, all the, the, the wind, wind farms and so forth. And okay. you could just meander your way around there, I huh. guess. And you could throttle up and down and turn and so. And the storm effects go around. Yeah, they even had storm storms. Storms happen. Was, <laughs> you know, a whole variety of conditions you wouldn't get exposed to on a normal boat. Okay. Right? I guess also, I mean, maybe this is a question for the commissioner too. But like, what role do you see 
you know, offshore wind, you know, we talk a lot about hydro as being part of our renewable energy portfolio, but like, where do you see hydro? I think wind was a really big issue maybe 10, 15 years ago that was fought in the courts. Where do you see um, offshore wind being part of the equation here? I think I think you answered your own question. It's it's part of the equation, um, but but there are other parts to it as well. I mean, there's we look to our north. Uh, hydro is is uh, huge uh, for us here in, in uh, the northeast, and so it's uh, it's good that uh, they're stretching out and that they will have another source in the coming years. It's not instantaneous. And uh, we need to make sure that all the same challenges that we face even today about grid capacity, um, house, houses, homes, uh, getting the upgrades they need uh, for heat pumps and so forth exist. We talked a little bit about there uh, one, at one of the um, get-togethers about, um, about housing in particular, especially with you know, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. We have the oldest housing stock in the nation, and most of them are um, are powered by fossil fuels. So this is a huge transition for for us in New England, and so the challenges are great. But we need we need more power. But we also there's so many other complications along with that that need to be incorporated, and that being the grid and grid capacity and who's going to pay for what. Well, thank you. <laughs> Calvin, what I would add to that is um, there's no question that offshore hydro has a big role to play in the renewable energy transformation. The art for Vermont is to find the right way to support it. They threw up a graph at the conference that showed all the coastlines of all the New England states, and there was one state that was conspicuously a different color, <laughs> and that was Vermont. <laughs> And the governor was very respectful with his colleagues and the Eastern Canadian premiers in owning up to the fact that while we are a regional partner and therefore participate in regional um, initiatives as well as decisions that are made at our ISO New England um, Center, uh, we have a different role. And so we've been supportive, for instance, of the effort that Massachusetts spearheaded to draw down what turned out to be close to $400 million in grant funding from the Department of Energy for the New England Power Up project that will build offshore wind. And what the governor saw in the simulator was a boat ride out to what that farm might look like. And that's, that's good stuff. But there are also serious rate impacts for building that infrastructure and also uh, the power that's ultimately generated and how it compares in the market against other fuels that it will have to compete against, such as natural gas. You know, until such time as ISA New England is told that it cannot or should not remain energy neutral in the market, you know, f uh, fuels like natural gas will be in the mix. And when offshore wind or any other fuel or uh, renewable energy source comes in at an auction at a higher price, it gets hard to justify uh, having ratepayers pay that. And uh, in Massachusetts, they feel those strains. Connecticut feels those strains. All of the states do. And so Vermont has a particularly artful diplomatic dance it has to conduct because we can be for that energy source as we have been. But in that instance, we're not bearing the direct ratepayer costs the way those states are. So it has a place. And we have to be careful with the role and the, the, the song we sing in the choir, so to speak. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Great. Other than the major disaster declaration for Lumoil, are there any other major flood recovery updates we should know about from the past week? Um, is Doug Farnham on? Mm -hmm. No? OK. Um, nothing that I'm aware of. Um, but. Um, we look forward to some of the other declarations being signed. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much.